Hello and welcome as it is the uh, 22nd day of October 2019. It is that of a uh, Tuesday. My name is Derek Albets Trades and of the like, like always, within each his own risk and their own reward. Alrighty then. Start off within gold. No, we're not. I'm not doing gold and silver until it breaks this correctionary phase. I'm going to refer to gold, gold and silver. You know, when gold and, when silver either, basically as long as it's in $17 range with the exception of about $17.05, I consider silver in a correctionary move, so I'm not going to, it's just, a, I won't show it or for a while or until it makes its move, and silver 1750 right now, so it's boring. But as far as this is concerned, which is the cross of the Canadian dollar, US dollar, this is what I find interesting amongst it. It has, it's been in, it was in a downtrend here throughout the 1990s, it bottomed around 2003, that's when silver bottomed after, it was in a downtrend. And then it topped, uh, in late October 2007, silver topped in uh, March of 2008, or half a year later. And then this was the, everything pretty much experienced this, so that's like whatever. And then this ends up topping in May of 2011, that's when silver topped. And then we had these lows around the same time silver did, and then this sideways correctionary move is silver's trying to do the same thing. Is it just a, I'm not going to say a foregone conclusion, gimme, whatever you want to call it, that both of these one going together within this time frame moving forward when if the one goes up the other goes up another way of putting it and I got to think not only if but when but we'll end up seeing crossing over to Bitcoin and there's really not much to go over it's in its correctionary phase as well and it's in the sideways range it is between about 78 and a half and about 87 it's uh, having its second day doing the same thing it did yesterday just hanging in there from the gain the gain the previous day Resisting the 18 average of highs and supporting not where it came from because it's supporting 81.88 where it came from was about 81 even. Just really hanging in there but not much to really cover based on that either still like I've been waiting or saying it's both saying and waiting that on the break of either support or resistance a large move either way as I'd be expecting low 6,000 or over 10,000 either way depending on the support or the resistance break. The dominance on BTC continues its uh, decline since the uh, September highs, and this level of previous support continues to be resisted. 18 average is in a decline, but its rate of descent is most certainly stopping, or not as much as it is before. Major support has re been, or the new leg of lower support is now around 68 and a third. It has been for a few days. And the key level of resistance, obviously, the 69, and again at about 69.6. And a move up to 69.6 is a statement in attempting to revert, resume really, the uptrend that of course has been going on for quite some time. Overall volatility of course very, very low. I've only made three trades since last night, but it's three considering I went about two days without making any. First off was Bitcoin Cash. I ended up selling for Litecoin and just like a lot of these other altcoins against Bitcoin and the dollar down significantly over a significant period of time or okay period of time definitely a significant amount in in levels of how much it's lost and as far as its attempt in reversal we haven't seen anything yet of course bitcoin dominance isn't showing anything for all coins ready to have fantastic moves and I, again i said this over and over and over and i continue to until i see evidence of, of me not to that it's it's just a matter of time and they're going to happen uh, sporadically, like that happens now, a few months later, a year later, all that kind of stuff. And then over, when it does happen, maybe over an X period of time, like say four weeks or 16 weeks, you have a lot of amazing choppy volatile up action uh, that should come within play. And of course, markets go up, markets go down. They do so very wildly. We can see in here there was a big up move, even just this little tick here and this little tick in here along the way. And now since then, we've been making all of these lows and these highs. Lately, though, it has been resisting in here, this level of support. So now we got this little range in here, breaking this little resistance. It's the back to the upper end of this range, breaking down below the support. Most likely, I'd be looking more for this level to be resistance, but then to have some sort of leg lower after that. That's noticeably, that's a noticeable level, like the three little bears. Not too big, not too small, just right, but a lot of them do become in as really really big as well within these markets both up and down it's just down usually takes longer than it does to go up in time i'd end up selling bitcoin cash to get litecoin which is 
within this uh, ratio here, I got about four and a quarter yesterday. Now at 422, so if it goes up here, I'll sell more Bitcoin Cash for Litecoin. If it goes back down, then I'll sell Litecoin to buy Bitcoin Cash. Moving on next to GoChain, which is the other two trades that I made, because after that, I ended up buying GoChain yesterday at 105 Satoshi. And I did so for that of Theta, which I sold Theta to buy it. And then this morning, I ended up selling GoChain at 111, and I bought Sky, Skycoin with it. Now what I've mentioned before in here a little few days ago is every single time you have a move like this that goes below the 18 average of uh, lows after having a move up, up like this, well there's only been one time that it has ever ever had uh, not a significant move lower which was pretty much the first one. So so far we'll see it's uh, it has to things go up down to here I think for a significant move. But uh, obviously you got a key low, this is now a key high. Where the bottom is going to be, where the high after that is going to be, well time will, again will only tell. And I'm not trying to predict it, I'm going to say, well it looks like it's going to go lower, but I mean some of my predictions are wrong and well, I'm going to be going through some of them on the fantasy spectrum after I'm done. The, uh, go, the go chain against uh, both uh, Theta and Sky. And then the Sky Go one, where I ended up buying here pretty much at the 18 average of lows. And a whole bunch of sell orders coming in, so there's one of the buybacks from the last sale, so uh, that's nice. I was hoping to get around 75 or better, 76, and I ended up getting even better than that, so that's nice. And on the Theta Go, which have all this choppy up and down action in here through July, August, and September. But from uh, the session in here, just... Uh, Managed to go up high enough in here where I was able to sell Theta for Go after uh, this nice little move in here. So roughly at around uh, close to 10 is where the trade would come in in the high $9 range. So if it goes up and I haven't got an indicator in it, don't really need one in right now. But if it goes and breaks above 11 or around in here, then I'll sell more Theta and buy more Go. And then if it comes... Uh, down towards in here to uh, below about eight inch high eights, then I would of course do the opposite, and in that case, selling go chain to buy theta. Moving on to fantasy. Yesterday I talked about fantasy football and the showdowns. I gave out a lineup yesterday with Patriots as the captain, Brian Brandon Bolden, Sony Michelle, and Julian Edelman. I added Le'Veon Bell and Ryan Griffin. I could have done better than that. But the Patriots defense was the right play. It was the captain. It was the best points. Um, Sody Michel had three rushing touchdowns, so he got it done like I was figuring he would. Brian, Brandon Bolden got a few catches, and Julian Edelman could have done better, but he still got some points. I finished uh, 7,368th. That was good enough to get a dollar back on a 50-cent bet. But the whole point that I was impressed with was having a unique lineup. When we see stuff like this, Bauer, 131 of 150, H. Patterson, 150 of 150, and all these. This is how many lineups these people played. So I only played the one. I didn't play any more. This person played 80. This person played the max of 150. So that was a $75 bet on that particular game itself for that player. You can play these at really minor and monster stakes when you look at just, well, myself. I played microscopically, but uh, as much as I, I can afford it, I just, I, I, I really control my risk and reward. And when it's a big, big gamble, even though I might have a long-term edge, and that's the key word, is it a might? I'm only going gonna, gonna to reduce my risk to low amounts. Again, 50 cents. Now, the winner of this game, well, there's 20 of them. A lot of them had multiple lineups in here. 173. First place was 4,000. These people won about 500. So they got about 12% of the first place prize pool. The lineup was having Patriots as a captain, Demarius Thomas, Philip Dorsett, James White, Sony Michelle, and Julian Edelman. And this is where I was wrong with the ownerships. And, and I'm trying to make more sense of it. And I finally did. I was trying to think, I, so I've been trying to think for an hour today. How did Le'Veon Bell get number one? I predicted it was going to be Patriots, Tom Brady, then Sony Michelle, actually. Then, like, Le'Veon Bell. Now, the top five are relatively a heat race, especially the top four, really, even. 
but yeah, Le'Veon Bell, 12,500, Tom Brady, 12,200, 11,000, really 12,000 for James White, and 11,800 for the defense of Patriots. Julian Edelman, 10,844. Now, the reason why Le'Veon Bell made sense is because if you were pro Jets, who are you going to take? Well, Le'Veon Bell, he was the first one. Then you had Jamison Crowder and Sam Darnold. Well, well, well below. Normally, it's the quarterbacks and running backs that get taken. Well, the running back is just that for Le'Veon Bell. But, but uh, Sam Darnold is just so bad that he actually got picked below a wide receiver. On the side of the uh, New England Patriots, Tom Brady was picked number one, and I did not expect that. I thought the Patriots' defense was going to be. They were picked big. But when the game started, I seen they were 38% owned in total. And about uh, 12 or a little over 10% here. I didn't do the percent yet. That I found to be very, very surprising. And I didn't think uh, that Sonny Michel was going to be this low on the list. So I got that one wrong. But not really. I talked to, In hockey, I'm predicting the ownerships in the games they have in the daily games. And I was wrong again yesterday with my prediction. It was a game between the Calgary... No, it wasn't. It was a game between the Ottawa Senators in Dallas taking on the Dallas Stars. And in that game... I was predicting that the ownership was going to be very large for the uh, the Dallas Stars. I didn't know how big it was going to be, but I was figuring at least two to one. It was not. It was closer to 60% ownership. This was a team that was a two and one favorite, so I was really, really wrong on that one. I was right, however, and when a number two string goalie plays, they're going to be less owned, and that was the case for the number two goalie of the... Uh, the Stars. It worked out to be one of those types of games that was not a great fantasy game, thus I ended up having a small loss on the session. As far as tonight's games are concerned, let's just take a quick look at them. I'm not, I, I got one bet for the next week. I'm not making a bet, and I have, I'm not making, I only have one bet until Monday. I made a bet last night in football. I'm going to lay 13 points. I am laying 13 points on the New England Patriots against the Cleveland Browns on Sunday afternoon. But there will be no traditional sports bets until then. I don't even know if I will be making any more in the near term after that in this traditional sense. I do like to wager. Of course, I wager in cryptocurrencies, and I'm wagering in daily fantasy in a strategy that I think is very interesting where I have very good long, short-term and long-term odds in my favor because I'm going to be moving on to probabilities and statistics after we go through this. Another chart will come in, and that chart will be this one here, but we'll get to that in a little bit. So Toronto takes on the Boston Bruins. We got Michael Hutchinson, who has been terrible so far for the Maple Leafs in goal. Boston, Toronto, I see a record of 5-3, 1-1. I mean, what up with these overtime losses? It's 5-5. Five five. Boston, 5-3. Five this has been the last two first-round matchups. This is a huge rivalry. I think the line is justified. Over under 6.5. Consensus, people are liking Boston. Which... I'm surprised it's as high as it is, actually, just because the least of the number one ranked market team. But Boston's like two or three. So these are like the top two ranked, ranked like markets in hockey going up against each other. And as Leafs are concerned, Leaf fans, this they are an interesting bunch as far as how they pack to go to every single NHL city that there is. But Boston is the hardest game for them to go to, so you won't have fine. It's, t it's a tough ticket. A lot of Leaf fans just don't even go because it's that hard even though it's not that, that far away from Toronto, compared to, like, say, Anaheim or Dallas or Vancouver or other like. San Jose is in Buffalo. We have Buffalo as a minus 115 favorite, basically a pick -em. The consensus is huge on the Buffalo Sabres. So if this was a daily showdown game, uh, if it was a daily showdown, how I would play each one. This one here, I would be playing huge on the Toronto Maple Leafs. This one here would be playing huge on the San Jose Sharks. Pittsburgh is in Florida, minus 135 for Florida, consensus 58 to 42. I am, uh, really, I mean, I got to think that Pittsburgh at plus 115 has got some value in it there. Uh, as far as showdown, I would have to uh, consider that uh, Florida is a play in the, in playing in uh, daily fantasy. But there is no, they only have one game, it's the last one. Arizona Rangers, we basically have a pick em on the game. 63% consensus for the New York Hockey Rangers. Rangers come in the game with a 2-4 and four record, 4-3 four and three for the Arizona uh, team. 
Really? Uh, even money for the home team? I mean, man, Darcy Kemper, 94.9% .9 save percentage. And then we got a 92.8. Maybe consider the under. I mean, I'm not going to look at the statistics on it. If this was Daily Fantasy, I would huge, be huge on Arizona. Even Arizona, period, because Arizona, people aren't allowed to play on DraftKings. And it's such a horrible, tiny market. Rangers are a major market. Vancouver at Detroit. Detroit plus 100 Vancouver. Really? I mean, Detroit, Vancouver's a better team. I think there's value in Detroit, or Vancouver, rather. And I would most certainly be playing that on the Daily Fantasy lineup if it was a one-game, one showdown, stacking mainly Vancouver players. Anaheim is in Nashville. Nashville minus 175, big favorite. Uh, consensus has them at 69%. They come in the game with a 4-4 four four record. Anaheim at 6-3. and three. Well, then. I think there's some value in the Anaheim. Ducks there at plus, uh, the, plus the price, and I'd be playing them on Daily Fantasy if they had that game. Edmonton is in Minnesota. I, mean, I might play a pro pool. I might, I'm going to go to the store and buy a ticket today. Yeah, okay, anyway, minus 126. Minnesota, we have uh, as a favorite against Edmonton. This is I always love Edmonton for Daily Fantasy because they got uh, Connor McDavid and... Uh, and you're picking the best player, Connor McDavid and Dreisaitl, so I have to play Edmonton goalies. But they are high consensus, so I do half the lineups with Edmonton and half the lineups with Minnesota in a spot like that. LA Kings, and then the spread here, we got minus 120. Again, I mean, all these good road underdogs. Edmonton, yeah, I kind of like Edmonton plus 109 there. Even just a fun parlay, stuff that I like to do. I put a parlay in with Edmonton, Anaheim, Vancouver... Uh, won't do anything. Uh, and Pittsburgh. As well as Buffalo, really. Buffalo, I mean, that's they're just doing dominant. See, the thing about these pools that I bet, it's always going big against consensus. So I'd have, like, Boston in there, and I would find a good few consensus ones here that I can go for and against kind of deal. Anyway, continuing on, LA Kings in Winnipeg. Winnipeg is a moderate favorite at minus 139, although it was minus 182 in the open. 73% uh, on Winnipeg, coming with a 5-5 five and five record. LA has been terrible. Jonathan Quick has been terrible. But Winnipeg hasn't been spectacular either. If I was in Daily Fantasy for this game, I'd be playing on the LA stack. Vegas is in Chicago. Pretty much a pick em with Vegas as a small favorite. Vegas coming in the game with a 6-4 and four record. Chicago 2-4. and four. So Chicago ain't doing too well. Probably a correct line. And in consensus here, I would play Chicago. Washington-Calgary is on my daily fantasy lineup. It's, it's oftentimes the last game, and it is this one as well. Calgary is a moderately small favorite at minus 120. Consensus is pretty much struck, struck down the middle. Uh, Washington comes in the game with a 6-4 and four record. Calgary at 5-5. Five and five. At uh, home, though, Calgary is 3-1, uh, and, one and uh, Washington's 4-1 and one on the road. So that makes it a very interesting matchup. Within such, uh, I like to look for picking captains, uh, playing teams where the they have sexy forwards, quote-unquote. Where I mentioned with Edmonton, they got McDavid and Drysdale, so I'm going to want to play their captains. In Toronto, they got Matthews, McDavid, not McDavid, they got Matthews, Marner, and when coming back from injury, John Tavares. So I like to go goalies there, especially the backup. I wish this was a showdown game because I'd be huge on the Leafs and Hutchinson tonight, but they don't have it. So we're therefore, I, I, I struck down the middle 50-50 on who's going to win. The consensus is struck down in the middle 50-50 who's going to win. My strategy says as long as I play the goalies as captains and four other players on your team and one on the other one, I'm going to do fine. So I'm going to have half my lineups on Calgary and half my lineups on Washington. But that all depends on the starting goalies too. I um, mean, here's the deal. Washington's got the sexy Ovechkin on there, so I kind of want to play Washington over and over again, too, just because everyone's going to want to play Ovechkin as captain. And normally, when you got a, one that's playing well, Johnny Gaudreau is very cold. He did break his multi-game uh, scoreless point streak, but all he didn't do fantastic his last game with just one assist. But he did look very, very good. So I do see, I think Calgary, if anything, might have a little bit of value, but given the other plays, minus 120, the fact that Washington is damn good and Calgary is off, didn't do that fantastic last year as a whole, and haven't started off the season well. If there wasn't as many great picks, I'd be thinking Calgary might be the way to go on this selection for tonight, but it really would be just tiny, tiny value. Earlier this morning, I made a... Uh, uh, program and it doesn't do much all it does is it tells you if you're doing sports betting
Okay, volume should be working. Okay. Anyway, this uh, this is a program language. What this does is I uh, I ask, what's the percentage win rate? If say if I can win, say uh, I get these are like minus one ten spreads. Say I'm winning uh, fifty five percent of the time over say uh, I don't know how many plays do you want to go say over 40 play, 45 games I'm gonna make 45 games what's the chances I'm gonna be a winner and it's gonna calculate why didn't it did I push something by mistake win percentage 65 percent so if I could win 55 percent of the games long term and I play 45 plays then I'm going to win 65% of the time. If I'm like a 69% super god mode player, like uh, the uh, uh, the poker player I've been mentioning, Stottle or Stottle, I think, or whatever. Anyway, if you can win like way more than is realistic or what well, impossible win for that matter. If I had a 69% win rate and I play 100 plays, I got a 99.9. .9 six eight percent chance of being that of a winner and using this and I can barely see the numbers on the left and unfortunately unless I just hold it like this which is what I'm going to do uh, that's the easy way you can see it so you have 40 percent all the way to 67 percent wins so the bottom numbers represent your percentage likelihood of winning and the right hand axle or axis represents the percentage chances that you are going to be a winner. And for what it's worth, I'd, I, I, there's only one type of people that can long-term maintain a 40, 41, 42% of a, a win rate. And those are the same people that can maintain a 58, 59, or 68% win rate. It's just to pick the opposite side on that one. I just don't see how anybody can do that bad. Because if you don't know anything about it, you got a 50-50 chance of winning. That's really what it comes down to. There's there's only two options that win when you're talking about point spreads. Okay, I was I left let go of the hold on. I should have uh, adjusted my settings beforehand to set it up for it. All I needed to do was just um, reduce things a few inches, and it would have worked. Anyway, it's you, I think you still see all these numbers below. Anyway, 50-ish or so percent is what the average person is going to finish. So in here, this is. Uh, Four, this is 49.50 at 51%, and 50%, we can see, comes down here. 52.3%, basically, and we can see that's right around the number, is what you need to be a winning player in sports. Because if you're getting a minus 110 line, as they have it, you have to win 11 of 21 games just to break even on the long term. But you're always going to have sample sizes. You can win 45% of the games, play 100, and win because, well, you're lucky. And... Another way of looking at it, too, is you could be somebody who's damn good. We'll go to the 57, 58%. These are realistic numbers I think you can attire for, but getting to those and getting above that becomes difficult. To say that you can get a good sample size of plays and win at these rates here, 65, 66%, at a good rate of size sample plays, I think is impossible. Or, very, very, or maybe the maximum the best could achieve. So with that being stated... 57, 58%. If you can grind this through, you got like an 80, 90% chance over 100 plays, you're going to come up ahead. But let's just think about 80, 90%. You're a 56, 57% winning player. You've done 100 plays and you could be down and you're like, what's going on here? I know I'm good. I know these plays are, are doing working. Well, that's just luck and variance. Sometimes you're going to be good. And you're going to be, and you're going to lose. But as you can see here, the math and the probabilities are always going to come into play. For if I had to run this with like 1,000, 5,000, or 10,000 selections, well, that would totally change things there. So now the reason why I think these numbers here, 64, 65, 66, can be possible, is if you become very picky, and that's why I was doing things like the uh, player pools. Find the lines that have the softest lines. Be very picky, look through hundreds and thousands of different ones. If you're damn good, I think you could sustain a percentage win rate in the low 60s. 
Of course, I mentioned yesterday, at least for the time being, I am going to stop doing so. And I mentioned even before the games even went on how the results would be on how I would continue on. It was all about a risk-reward management setup, basically. And the reason I was doing those was because, well, one, these markets here, of everything, the markets are very, so dry, just not much for me to do. And I want to do something uh, challenging, find, uh, and have some fun with it, but something I feel that I can win. And I still think that I could if I wanted to do it, but the reason why I'm going to forego and could stop uh, player uh, picks on, uh, like I was doing, doing the last two weeks, other than the fact that I had a very poor week, and thus the risk reward management is because I already have action. I'm, I'm trading this stuff all the time, these markets. And when I started doing those pools a couple of weeks ago, or those football things a couple of weeks ago, well, that meant I was, uh, I wasn't thinking that I was going to do the hockey stuff that I've been doing now. And that's more fun. I like that much, much more. And I like my return on investment more on it. Now, GRS, DGB, this one, I don't know what's going on here. Last I checked on this, this was like well over, this is 4 or 5% lower. It's just breaking out. So GRS is going up slash DGB going down. But I don't want to ratio trade, and this is close to 28. So it's something to look at. I'm going to make sure that I got an alert on this. Okay, so we got uh, GRS, DGB. Do I have an alert? Crossing 29. I have even higher than that. You know what? Yeah, keep it at that. Go for the bigger, better trade. Although 29 is pretty big. Is that not working the edit? Okay, let's do 28. 55. That's a nice little move above this resistance here. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, GRS and just see what's going on there. Maybe that's going up. It's either that or DGB going down. And within it, we have a uh, small update on GRS. 24.23 is the price, 27 now, up 2.54%. Uh, and on the single hour, it's just starting to get going. Big volume coming in. Hopefully, this is the start of those big moves that I happen. And that's just an interesting thing to go over. When you see something like this happen, it could be that... Are we going to get one of those failed breakouts? And if so, how high is this going to break out to? You're at a point now here where this is an interesting play. This is where I think, is this a smart time to go long on something like this? Because you see that the volume's coming in. You see that, okay, maybe we're going to have that failed breakout. But if that's the case, maybe this is the height of that failed breakout. And again, maybe it's going to be higher than that. Is this the start of a big move that can start like a 2, 3, 4x move? And you realize you could put stops maybe down in an area that might only even crew uh even areas of like uh we're looking at this below this line 2300 you could do a stop of like 120 basis points like five percent stop for what could be sick gains however it is i'm not going to try to calculate nor am i going to change up my play i got grs trading against both litecoin and that of uh dgb although i should be trading against theta too but whatever and uh I'll just keep training it that way. Again, like I showed with the DGB ratio, I still need uh, price action to go up a little bit higher. And on the one minute time frame, this all started here at uh, 10.15 a.m. It's 10.54 as I'm doing this now. Uh, as the price went from 23.88 to 24.60, some decent buying, and now we're getting the sideways action on much lower volume. So someone's wanting to buy this. So I'm actually... I gotta think this looks like a pretty decent setup moving into today. We'll see how it goes. I'll uh, update this as uh, later today or into tomorrow. And have yourself a great day. Bye bye.